When people show up to work, they have a certain level of trust for their employer. Sometimes that's earned and sometimes it's just blind faith. And let's face it, with all that's been going on in the world, today's factory floor has many challenges that didn't exist just a few years ago. Award-winning professional engineer John Pushkar has spent his life trying to prevent fires and explosions at workplaces. Mr. Pushkar is offering this three-part series that spells out, in non-technical terms, hazards that might be found for those that operate or work near gas-fired equipment like bakery ovens, boilers, industrial ovens, or furnaces. The goal of these episodes is to put more knowledge about possible hazards in your hands so that you can have more of a role in protecting yourself at work. Thank you, Layla. Again, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Pushkar. I'm president of Prussian Technical Services. I'm here today to give you more information about how to stay safe out there in the world of fuels and combustion equipment. I know the title of today's episode is Troubleshooting. This is not any attempt at all to encourage you to troubleshoot equipment or to give you the skills or knowledge necessary. No, instead what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep you alive in environments where equipment doesn't seem to work properly, you're not an expert. You see people mulling around, the control panel's open, they're trying different things, and they're troubleshooting. In my experience over the past 40 years, the majority of incidents where there's been fires and explosions and people maimed and killed, well, they happen because of human error. And more than half the time, that human error, it involves troubleshooting. You're possibly in a circumstance where you have no choice but to have blind faith in your employer. I want to take you a little bit out of that world. I want to open your eyes to some things that should cause you to ask questions of people. I want to arm you with some information today that could give you good questions to ask, that could alert you that there might be signs of danger, and possibly one of these could save you or your colleagues from some type of disaster. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. John, I understand that today's topic is all about troubleshooting equipment. Don't most places have people around that are experienced maintenance people that can handle this well? Layla, the short answer is yes, but you got to understand I'm somewhat biased here. I come from a world where part of my job was to show up at places to see what actually happened, to see what caused the windows to blow out, to see what caused the employees to be injured to see what devastated and leveled the facility to the ground. And like I said, quite often it was people troubleshooting, trying to understand and investigate why there were problems with the equipment. And quite often, in fact, far too often, there were shortcuts taken to keep equipment in production. Let's face it, today we live in a world where there's a shortage of people that truly understand combustion equipment and have the skills and knowledge to troubleshoot it effectively. Throw in overwhelmed contractors, a shortage of labor, supply chain issues to get critical parts, and what COVID has done to even retaining some of the more skilled employees, and we've got a recipe for disaster in many facilities. Quite often, the folks that are sent to troubleshoot these things are electricians. There are many wonderful, very highly skilled electricians and there are circumstances where a button or a switch may have failed and they find it and replace it. But frankly, as you're going to see, there are some very scary situations that I found where people with not enough skill or knowledge have taken shortcuts that have ended up creating disasters. 
What kinds of things have you seen in some facilities that has caused you concern, and what should those watching especially be concerned with? Layla, I want to take everybody through five particular things that I've seen that are horrendous examples of steps that have been taken to shortcut proper repairs. If you're around a facility and you hear people talking about bypassing things, the hair on your neck should be standing up. You should be very concerned because quite often these are critical safety devices which for some reason they don't understand how to repair or the parts aren't available for and they're going to try to operate the equipment without these things. Quite frankly, in many circumstances, that's a criminal activity. That's gross negligence in the legal world. These are things that people should understand and know about, especially if you happen to be one of these maintenance people. You should never participate in this kind of activity. So let's start with this first picture I'm showing you. This happens to be a real life control panel for a piece of combustion equipment that was at an industrial site. How could you ever find anything in here and be able to troubleshoot it effectively? There's wires everywhere, they're not color coded, they're not marked. I don't even understand how someone could follow a schematic and know that they've done the right thing here. If your facility has lots of panels like this, you've got trouble. The second picture I want to show you is where an airflow proving switch was compromised with a popsicle stick. This particular piece of equipment wouldn't stay running. No one had a spare switch, so they opened the cover, jammed a stick in there to make it work, and went on with their day. This is something one of my people found when we were sent to the site as a third party to do safety interlock function testing. Here's another way that folks have compromised devices. This is also inside an airflow proving switch cover, and you can see they've just terminated the wires on the same terminal. This completely defeats the purpose of the switch. You can have completely inadequate airflow here for the purge or for combustion. There could be a newspaper that gets sucked up on the inlet air screen, and frankly, the gas valves would stay open. You'd have too rich of a condition in the firing chamber, and you could have a horrible explosion here that kills people. And the last picture I want to show you Remember I told you that anytime you hear the word bypass, it's a big sign of trouble? Well, these are jumper clips. Here you could see jumper clips applied in an electrical panel. This is something that's done occasionally for testing under very controlled conditions, but it's also a way that those who don't know any better end up bypassing critical safety components. If you happen to see jumper clips installed inside a panel or little temporary pieces of wire, maybe the wire is a different gauge than the other. Maybe all the rest are marked and this one isn't marked. Maybe it's a different color. Maybe it's the way it's terminated. All of those could be problem, possible implications that someone has defeated a safety device. It's a reason to investigate. And lastly, I want to show you in this picture how someone has decided to defeat a safety relay. You can see there's cardboard stuffed into these relays to hold them open. This happens to be on a flame safety proving device. So with these relays held open, the machine thinks that there's a flame on all the time. This keeps the gas valves open. Well, what happens if for some reason, for example, the airflow disappears or there's some other problem, maybe with the flu? we end up pouring lots of gas into the firebox. There's no longer a flame. The flame detection system doesn't know that. And again, we have a horrible explosion. So what do you do about these things? Thanks, John, for telling us, but what do we do about it? Well, if you're represented, if it's a union facility, you go to your health and safety people. If you happen to be a maintenance person and you're being asked again to make these compromises, you steer completely clear of this. Maybe there's a call to OSHA. Hopefully, you work with very reasonable people and someone will listen and understand that they're putting folks at a tremendous risk here of getting hurt and possibly killed. 
John, this has been very helpful. I think we've opened up a lot of eyes with this information. Thank you, Layla. It's been a pleasure to do this interview and to be able to pass on this very important information. If you're ever in a circumstance where you have questions, you're welcome to call me, drop me an email. I'm happy to help. Remember, at the end of the day, the life that you save, it just might be yours. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being a legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending, and remember, be safe out there. The life you save, it just might be yours.